Well, I think it, it's uh, my notion of it is it's an inform that the way we experience it, it's an informing understanding. It's on one level, it's simply appropriate activity. You know, knowing how to do everything because it is the Tao of the ancestors. In other words, you can sort of see yourself as the as the most recent version of your family's genes. And in all traditional activities, there's millions of years of morphogenetic fields stored up for how you pick something up, how you sit something down. So in the immediate sense, the manifestation of spirit is appropriate activity. What it really is, I think, is some kind of hidden howness that makes everything be as it is. And that's what the spirit is. In other words, science describes the possible things that can happen. Science is the study of possibilities. And what nobody has ever answered is how is it that out of the entire class of possibilities, certain things actually undergo the formality of occurring? Somehow they are selected out of the class of the possible and they become the actual. Well, the thing which mediates the coming into being of the actual out of the class of the possible is what I think the spirit is. It is the, the invisible hand, if you will. It is the guiding force. It is the invisible landscape over which becoming flows like a river. It defines, it creates. It is this telos that I mentioned, this attractor at the end of time. Other, yes, back there. Uh, yes, Terrence, uh, has there been any research that you have, uh, know of uh, in uh, relation to electron spin resonance recently since the invisible landscape. <coughs> and secondly, uh, can tryptomy act as a mechanism for release of genetically stored material uh, through that ESR, electron spin resonance, with an interpolation of tryptomy was skin long as substances into the neural DNA? Right. In essence, is it a genetic, uh, is that a genetic mechanism for uh, racial uh, memory? Well, in the invisible landscape, that's what we were suggesting. And the invisible landscape was published in 1975. Uh, since then, there's been a lot of work with NMR and ESR, none of it which overthrows this idea. Uh, it's a real question about the, uh, the where is the epigenetic data stored? In other words, all the memories that you accumulate during your life die with you. Your genetic material you can pass on at least half to your children. And, and so it, during the life of the individual, this epigenetic material, experience, anecdotes, memories, anticipations, how, where is it molecularly stored or is it molecularly stored? In the invisible landscape, we were suggesting that uh, thought is actually a naturally occurring ESR readout of portions of the DNA which were not associated with genetic expression, but which were somehow like uh, uh, write, uh, writable memory in a computer. The epigenetic stuff was being stored there. There's no data to overthrow that notion that I'm aware of. I'm not, I don't cling to it uh, as strongly as I once did. I, th I look more and more. I, see, I didn't realize that this was a fundamental break, this uh, allowing of spirit into the scientific model of the world. And... Uh, uh, I now think of the, the brain as a receiver of the phenomenon of consciousness. 
that I don't believe that that consciousness is generated in the brain any more than that television programs are made inside my TV. You know, the box is too small. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, it just obviously is too small. I, I mean, it might not be if you didn't have the psychedelic experience, but once you splice that and they say, well, it's taking, you know, 10 high 16 megabytes of memory to store this database, so it just doesn't, I just don't think it would be done like that. I think that there is a somehow this field phenomenon that I keep returning to. This is another slice on what the spirit is. It is this field of some sort of energy that organisms, as they evolve, discover, right? Already somehow present in the environment. It is the, the appetition for being that drives organic uh, evolution into this kind of dance of relatedness to this other thing which it can transduce from another dimension. That's why, you know, if you take consciousness expansion, the phrase, or consciousness enhancement seriously, it must be very important because consciousness is, after all, uh, what it's all made out of. That's the name of the game. So, uh, this transducing of uh, higher states of consciousness then seems uh, uh, very important. Even at that, it will be necessary to elucidate the physical mechanism, whether it's ESR, NMR, or what it is. An interesting um, sort of opportunity for psychedelic research. You see, the amazing thing about psychedelics is not only that they are illegal and restricted from the so-called ordinary person, but they are restricted to scientific research. Nobody can do research on psychedelics. I mean, it is professionally and practically impossible to do it. Well, there's no other area where this is true. I mean, science probes obscenely into the, pri the most private areas of our sex lives, our social lives, our dream lives. Monkeys are smashed against walls to study. I mean, there's no limit to it. And yet there's this total hands-off attitude toward... Uh, the psychedelics. So an interesting break in this front is the sudden need because of uh, computer-assisted tomography, CAT scanning, the need for compounds which locate in certain highly defined parts of the brain. If you could tritiate these drug compounds uh, and make them radioactive, you could make very nice pictures of various parts of the brain. So now suddenly there is an interest in all this old psychedelic research about the receptor site and location densities of molecules in the brain. So we, meet, we may be on the brink of an era where to have a psilocybin trip in the evening you must have signed on for a CAT scan uh, at General <laughs> Hospital in the morning. Someone else. <coughs> I have a couple of questions. I guess I'd like to hear just about the state of uh, these plants that you feel that you need to sort of rescue them from the Amazon and bring them into Hawaii and how many types of plants there are and that kind of thing. Well, um, the, every time I have gone to the Amazon plant collecting, I've observed that the cultures, the indigenous rainforest cultures, are more and more disrupted. And there's a lot of... Uh, conservation and big organizations raising money to preserve the rainforests and to get large tracts of rainforests set aside. But there is no awareness or social uh, conscience about the fact that the presence of capitalism in the Amazon is totally disrupting tribal human culture. So these people who have been tribal for thousands of years, uh, the men are just totally walking out on the traditional lifestyle and taking their canoe a hundred miles downriver and signing on at sawmills and on oil 
uh, drilling crews and this sort of thing. And so the consequences of this is that far more rapidly than the rainforest itself is being destroyed, uh, the human cultural interaction with the rainforest is being lost and thousands and thousands of species of medicinal plants, antibiotics, immune stimulators, hallucinogens, analgesics, uh, all these different kinds of plants, this data, this lore is being lost. And when you realize that, you know, 80% of the drugs sold in the United States are in fact traceable to plant sources. And in spite of the vaunted success of so-called strategic pharmacology, where you just think up the drug you think you need and make it in the laboratory, it really, it's still a lot of, the, of what drug companies do is screen for plants uh, and cash in on folklore, basically. So it's important to preserve these plants and uh, the lore about them. Because you see, I mean, like, it's really hard to explain how some of these plants have been discovered. For instance, in the case of ayahuasca, ayahuasca is a visionary shamanic brew that happens to be made of two, two different plants, Banisteriopsis copy, supplies an MAO inhibitor and Secotria viridis supplies DMT. Either plant by itself is inert and you have to know to brew the wood and bark of one with the leaves of the other and you have to know that it's in a certain proportion and you have to know to concentrate it to a certain degree. Well, when you realize that an, a square mile of Amazonian rainforest can have 120,000 species of plants on it, I mean, that's in contrast to when you go into the Sierras, a square mile of forest may have 150 species of plants on it. So it's an ultra complex environment and human beings who knows by what means? I mean, it's, it is, to my mind, that the vegetable spirits lead them to it, have sussed out all this knowledge that is, uh, you know, an, a seamless web of understanding about nature. And uh, so this is what we're trying to preserve in Hawaii. I think ayahuasca is a good example. It has tremendous potential for psychiatry it is a purgative, it kills intestinal parasites, it uh, appears in agar, in slant culture, to kill the trypanosome of malaria. Well, instead of delivering high-priced drugs made in Germany and the United States to the outback of Indonesia, where malaria is raging, you could simply send in thousands of cuttings of this plant. People could grow it as a dooryard plant, take it as a tea on a weekly basis, and uh, malaria would be held at bay. There are over 200 plants uh, in a recent review article that I saw known from Africa that appear to be immune stimulating plants. Well, God, this should have everybody on the edge of their seat. The breakdown of the immune system and the whole AIDS-related complex and all of that, uh, it, the, it, it turns out that adaptations to plants in traditional cultures have conferred uh, or have stimulated the immune system and conferred certain kinds of immunity. Well, then this could be the basis for a drug strategy of some sort and so on. So this is the kind of preservational work that we're doing there. Yes, you, against the wall. Yes, Karen, thank you. Um, a few days ago, you were on KPFK with Roy, and you mentioned briefly San Pedro. That's what you said, right? I, you were talking about the uh, uh, <coughs> plant, the uh, San Pedro cactus. I Could you just Give me briefly background, maybe a parallel between the experience or your experience if you had it with San Pedro to that of um, psilocybin mushrooms. Because when I tried San Pedro cactus, 
mixing it with vanilla ice cream didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what work means, but it must have startled your stomach. <laughs> it was pretty vile. And I didn't know what I was doing. Well, I, I don't really know that much about San Pedro. I've never gotten around to it. I know a person who swears by it, but they have a elaborate way of cooking it up in a pressure cooker. Mescaline, which and and halamine, and halamine, and methyl mescaline, all of these things are occurring in, in that plant. Uh, it's an amphetamine-related thing. It tends to be pretty rough of the of the natural. Uh, hallucinogens, the really the big ones as I think of them. Mescaline is the harshest. An operating dose is considered to be actually close to a gram, 700 milligrams, which you, one way that pharmacologists dr judge the toxicity of a drug is by how much it takes to get you off. And the less it takes, then the more benign the drug is thought to be. So on that scale, mescaline doesn't do too well. But my experience with mescaline has been with peyote, which I gather is somewhat similar. And uh, it's been interesting. It's hard to take enough to really reach the deep water without it really reacting on your stomach. It's not the cleanest uh, way to go. I think that you know, having looked at these things in South America and in many places, uh, in my experience, the mushroom just is it. I mean, other things have other aspects to it and bring it in, but uh, the mushroom is an extraordinary organism. It's like it's engineered for that purpose. And I've spoken about how it was almost strewn in the path of developing primitive man in Africa because uh, it was associated with the manure of cattle and on the and the ungulate herds of Africa evolving on the veldt at the same time that the human animal was evolving a complex pack signaling language and so forth it just set the stage it seems to me it was the catalyst I really believe that we are in a symbiotic relationship with these plants and that the mushroom, by virtue of being global in its distribution, is probably a major slice relationally of that pie. And in other, in other words, that the peculiar turn that evolution took in our species the reinforcing of self-reflective consciousness and the reinforcing of linguistic signaling has to do with the presence in the human diet in that early stage of these mushrooms. Uh, it's known that the mushroom, that low amounts of psilocybin, subthreshold doses of psilocybin, increase visual acuity. Well, it isn't hard to figure then that if evolutionary pressure is operating on a hunting species, a pack hunting species, that visual acuity is going to be uh, 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 at a premium. And if uh, small amounts of psilocybin in the food chain increase, increase visual acuity, those animals will be selected and survive. Well, then their habit of using, of accepting the mushroom as a food lays them open for this linguistic synergy, this symbol forming capacity, and then, and then the, the deeper, more ecstatic experiences with psilocybin, which are then projected onto the mushroom, onto the cattle, become the basis for a kind of cattle, goddess, mushroom, a, a cycle of a herophony, the discovery of the tremendum I mean, almost as though in the scene in 2001 where the apes encounter the monolith, it was precisely that, except that the monolith was a mushroom. It was a superbly genetically engineered omnivorous uh, uh, organism that could insert itself into the ecosystem of a planet and begin to coax an effect out of a mammal that it had a relationship to. And this effect coaxed out of the mammal is this 
relationship to this higher dimensional waveform which we call the spirit or mind which is apparently you know that's what it's all about why this is happening is not clear I mean in the mushroom book I suggested that it was because there is some awareness of planetary finitude that the mushroom actually thinks on so large a scale that it is using us uh, to make machines for it to perpetuate it uh, throughout uh, the nearby galaxy that it is aware of the finite nature of our star uh, we don't know we don't plan yet on those kind of scales we're an infant race very obstreperous and uh, the mushroom said to me once if you don't have a plan you become part of somebody else's plan <laughs> one of its slightly more paranoid <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it is good I think to have a plan and to have allies and uh, the mushroom is very contemptuous of the notion of, of humans having human allies it says you know for one human being to think it could gain enlightenment from another is like for one grain of sand to think it could gain enlightenment from another so it really believes in uh, you know hierarchical levels and trickle down gnosis which I'm not sure how I view that I believe all secrets should be told and that we should just lay our cards on the table but maybe I don't have as many cards as they do so we play by their rules on the aisle um, uh, you're, you're a wonderful, convincing speaker, and I'm sure nobody here needs to be, uh, have, has any self doubt or doubt about what you're saying, but in case they do, I want to bear a witness and testimony to what you're saying. Um, it's absolutely true that there's this intelligence that wants to connect to us and that we want and need to make a record to connect to because, as you say, it's extremely informative. And uh, you're saying um, that one way we can do this is through the psychedelic experience, which I agree with what you to me. But uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the Western tradition of the mysteries, which involves ritual and using ritual in order to maintain, uh, to uh, uh, stimulate, and maintain contact with this nature spirit, which uh, I might add is. Uh, is a, a spirit that's just bursting at the seams right now to connect to us and inform us and talk to us and help us. Yes, well, uh, Mersiliad talked about the difference between sacral and profane time. And he said the way you leave history is you sacralize a space and you sacralize a space through ritual you you abolish the profane constraints of space and time the here and now and you imagine that you are what he what he called in ilio tempore in the time before in the paradisical time before the fall this goes back to what i said about the anuttara yoga tantra the imagining of these titanic godlike states of mind as a ground for being yes I would never have thought I mean I've been pushed to my position by my experience I mean I'm amazed at what I have to say based on what I've experienced because I never thought it would be this way you know I came up a whole different way I was a Marxist and an existentialist and all of these things and it was as you testified it's the pure evidence of it. I mean, you can, uh, you can convince yourself intellectually that something is true, but it's only in the, uh, in the uh, embrace of the tremendum that it just sweeps over you how true it is. And uh, as far as the difference between establishing these connections through psychedelics and through ritual, I think deep psychedelic tripping uh, is something that you don't do very often simply because each time it's so rich it takes a long time 
to process this stuff. It's much better to go deeper seldom than, uh, than to diddle with it in the other ways that people do. I mean, it often seems to me that it's not even so much a matter of, uh, of, of you know, spreading the good word and turning it into a mass movement. It might be much more interesting if simply the people who were already in on the secret did it more conscientiously and more deeply. Although, uh, I hasten to add that you shouldn't do too much. You should never do <laughs> more than about six or seven grams of mushrooms. I say that because I keep hearing stories about people who think going deeply means doing a lot, and they do amounts which stand my hair on end. I mean, in the past month, traveling around, I've heard stories where I just say, you know, and people are crazy, you know. <laughs> say, I couldn't remember whether you said five grams or five ounces. <laughs> So to be safe, I did an ounce and a half. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's important to uh, <laughs> it, it's important to get there. Granted, but it's important to come back. <laughs> oh Lord, yeah. In your talk, you um, said something about the transcendental object. The way I imagine that history works is, well, first of all, let me say how the way the people I disagree with think it works. And then you had cooling and uh, development of atomic and molecular and organic and ultimately cultural and uh, systems and ultimately technological systems. And... Uh, this will go on indefinitely uh, down unto the heat death of the universe and the development of life and of culture has nothing to do with the physical, astrophysical level of things. It's sort of ancillary and a mistake. My view is somewhat different. It's that if we have to have a singularity in our cosmology. In other words, you, it's so hard to figure out how you get from nothing to something. No philosophical school has ever been able to do it without some kind of singularity. So if we're going to have a singularity in our system, let us try to make it as logically palatable as possible. So how to do that? It's not logically palatable to me to believe that the universe sprang from nothing in a single instant. It seems to me if you believe that, you're set up to believe anything. <laughs> right? I mean, isn't that it? I say, well, if they'll believe this, what wouldn't you believe? So how about this instead? That the universe, uh, its origins are a mystery and cannot be determined. But as we look at its history, the history of it that is available to our inspection, what we see is increasing complexity ending in ourselves and our civilization so far as we know. Well, then if you're going to have a singularity, I think of a singularity as a kind of phase transition you know, Ilya Prigozhin talks about how uh, a, a chemical system will suddenly and spontaneously migrate to a higher state of order. Well, that's sort of how I think of this thing. It is capable of migrating to a higher state of order. So, uh, if we're going to have a singularity, isn't it more likely that it will emerge out of a situation of vast complexity than a situation of utter metaphysical nothingness? I think so. So I think that what the transcendental object is, is it is uh, the cause of the universe, if you will, except that this cause is at what we would conventionally refer to as the end. It's what everything flows toward. 
It isn't something wound up which runs down. It's something diffuse which is gathered in to something. And, th- and this gathering in takes the form not only of a progressive densification at the physical level, but of a progressive complexification at the organizational level. It also is a kind of a spiral. It has a temporal closure so that each epoch of, uh, of closure happens more quickly than the ones which preceded it. And what I mean by that is it took the, you know, the universe is 20 billion years old. Uh, the first 5 billion years, it, well, no. The first 10 billion years, it was all about star formation and nuclear cook down of heavier elements out of lighter elements. And then you get molecules which signify a higher level of organization which can only go on at a lower temperature. So as temperature leaves the universe, more complex systems become possible. And then ultimately, polymers of great lengths become possible. So this complexification is occurring and it is uh, at each stage more rapid than the last. Now, the emergence of self-reflection, of self-reflection in our own species is part of this. It isn't a fluke. It isn't an accident. It is obedient to the same natural law which created these other systems. And the emergence of our own curiously alienated and at odds with itself culture is also a, a part of this phenomenon we are initiating a kind of crisis with the planet. It is in the same way that a fetus will become septic if it is carried too far beyond term. There is a crisis now in the Gaia human system. The two must be parted. And the transcendental object is this knitting together of the organic intent of the planet to somehow expel us from the planetary environment in some way which is very hard for us to foresee and anticipate because it is in fact the transcendental object. I mean, by appointing a committee to look into this, we are not going to find out what it is. It is the, it is the face of the abyss. It is the transcendental object. It cannot entirely be known. It is the living embodiment of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. You know, science has taught us that there are no mysteries. There are only unsolved problems. This is a mystery, not an unsolved problem. Nevertheless, it is the the narrowing vector of our timeline. And as some of you probably know, my in my opinion. Uh, around 2012 AD, we will cross into, cross through novel epochs of concrescence and the transcendental object will be manifest. It's a very curious thing. It's something which is coming toward us from the future, but we are creating out of our intellectual and technological anticipation of deity, really. I mean, at times I've spoken of it as the flying saucer. It is the flying saucer. And it does enter history at a certain moment. And it is coming toward us. But as we go toward it, we are becoming what we behold. In effect, what I'm saying is that the entirety of human history is a kind of psychedelic apotheosis where we are involved in a hieroscamos, a kind of alchemical marriage. And what the, you know, what the next 25 years are about is advancing to meet the bride. And the bride is the unimaginable and uh, uh, unanticipatable fulfillment of our heart's desire. You know, we are becoming what we behold. Our metaphysical hypostatization of deity is becoming a cultural program for our completion. 
And that's why communication is so important because what we're trying to do is articulate this vision of the oversoul of our species. We are going into a kind of swarm state or there is a, a pheromonal transformation of our cultural modalities. Our pheromones are information systems and now information systems, ideologies are being released into the mass psyche that actually set us up to undergo this cultural compression and uh, concrescence that the experience of the transcendental object is. If you haven't read William Gibson, you might give him a go. His anticipation of a cybernetic future is part of the anticipation of the transcendental object. And what Gibson is saying in Neuromancer and Count Zero is that data storage in hyperspace will become conventionalized the way the grids of cities are conventionalized in three-dimensional space so that when you jack in to cyberspace, you will find, you know, you will see the Bank of America database like an enormous red neon oblong glowing off to your left and over the horizon, the Transworld Airlines database. In other words, the dimension of culture, which for 15,000 years or so has been, uh, uh, for purposes of comparison, let's say, a thin as a thick sheet of paper. I mean, what has culture been? It's been a few mud huts, some brick streets, a cathedral here and there recently, and then more recently a lot of knitted together, electrified, uh, cheap uh, construction. Suddenly, the dimension of culture is about to be, it, which is orthogonal to ordinary reality, is about to be expanded a hundred, a thousand fold into a complete mind space, the cyberspace that Gibson is talking about, the psychedelic space that shamans have always known about is about to be uh, uh, activated as a cultural artifact in high-tech uh, high tech society where we will become whatever we imagine. You know, you will move off into this electronically sustained realm of mind. At least that's how I imagine it. I imagine that passage through the transcendental object leads into the imagination and that the imagination is really our true home and that all of this electronics and culture and art and drugs and magic and ritual is about the prodigal return to the imagination as a cultural norm and, uh, and uh, the transcendental object represents the narrow neck, the narrowest place, the place where the phase transition occurs. At least that's what I hope. That's what I feel the symbiosis with the hallucinogens is coaxing out of us because we cannot go to the stars in the ape mindset, you know, with ape politics and uh, it's just impossible. And very clearly we are on the brink of taking control of our own self-image. This is what the long cultural march has been. This is the justification, if there is one, for science is that it does give us a certain measure of control over stuff and it's out of, it is the the mirror of our minds that we will make out of stuff that we will eventually perform this magical evocation in front of and walk through into the time outside of history, the place before history. Another question. Somebody over here. Yes, sir. Terrence, welcome to LA. Uh, people who listen so many hours on the radio, I just want to say we really love you. And I, I just think that's what you're going to say. Although I have to 
to admit I take the show on my VCR and I get it during the day. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was going to go to Mexico to a little village up in Oaxaca. And my companion sort of convinced me that it might not be the best idea because while you're looking around for green men, you might find some federales or something and it might not be the best place to totally let go. So I decided to grow some mushrooms and that just ended up on the low priority of things that I still haven't grown them, you know? But I was always of the fantasy that going to this place in Mexico, there was something magic there. And there was this quote-unquote morphic residence and I wanted to know if there was a morphic residence, wouldn't that be in the negative time-space frame? And so my question is, one, do you buy this morphic residence idea? And uh, that's, the that's the question. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, my one of the best people, one of the very, very best people that I've found in the, in the so-called New Age is Rupert, Rupert Sheldrake. I mean, he and I are tight. And we've spent a lot of time just pushing these ideas around. Um, ultimately, I think probably he's very much on to something. It's interesting that it's such a, considered such a radical idea because think about what it says. It says that things are as they are because they were as they were. One can hardly imagine a more conservative philosophy. <laughs> In fact, the, the problem for this philosophy is to therefore explain how anything ever manages to be different, how any kind of novelty could emerge out of a situation where the past is so present that it configures everything. So uh, Rupert's idea and my idea, which I haven't discussed except by implication tonight, but I, I have this notion which is embodied in the software of a wave of novelty a way of quantifying the flux of the Tao. And uh, a wave of novelty would be necessary to, uh, for Sheldrake's idea to support the coming into being of new forms. Uh, I mentioned this evening in the main body of my talk the term compressionism. I've just sort of begun to think about this. I like it because I like Impressionism, Abstract Expressionism, Surrealism. I like it because it's an art movement, not a science. But I would number the Compressionists that come to mind to be Rupert Sheldrake, uh, Ralph Abraham, Frank Barr, and uh, myself bringing up the rear. And uh, we all four of us have a slice on it, each different, but each leading to this same set of conclusions, that there is a set of hidden variables which we all describe differently, but that these hidden variables are channeling the development of events. And what this signifies is a new way of thinking about time. And it's all very much in flux. Rupert is a true, a true great scientist and gentleman. If the theory of morphic res resonance can be overthrown, it will be, and he will lead the charge. Our effort when we get together, much of our effort is experimental design. We try to think of experiments that would disprove the notion because it is a notion which m asserts very firmly certain strange things about reality should be uh, measurable and discernible. So, uh, morphic resonance, my novelty waves, the dynamic attractors of Ralph Abraham, and, uh, and the uh, fractal hierarchies of Frank Barr are all embryonic efforts. There's a feeling in the air, a sense of an idea to be uh, uh, nailed down. 
And I'm convinced, you know, that in the next 10 or 15 years, one of us or somebody we know or somebody sitting at the table nearby will uh, work it out. It's really the great intellectual adventure of our time. And it, it carries us all along with it. When this thing is figured out, it's going to be understandable to all of us. It is going to end the era of the professional abstraction. You know, for the new paradigm to work, it's going to have to transform the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And uh, that's the point that has been missed by the proponents of uh, some of the more narrow versions of what the new paradigm is. The new paradigm will be an understandable explanation of the world. Understandable to whom? To you, to me, not a, an abstraction sanctioned by a professional elite and handed down by the academy. Doesn't some aspect of this phenomenon have to be able to, to be translated into numbers in order to convince straight society of its existence? Well, that's the beauty and the wonder and the delight of time wave zero. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this, this was produced to convince scientists. What this thing does is it draws graphs of the ingression of novelty into time. I advance novelty as a new primary quality of the space-time continuum on a par with charge, spin, angular momentum. Novelty. This is the realm of the hidden variables. And this program makes thousands of experimentally testable assertions. This is not smoke and mirror stuff. You give it an end date, you give it a date of interest, and it draws a mathematically defined graph of its opinion as to where the flux of novelty and habituation, these are the two opposed quantities, novelty and habituation, where they fall vis-a-vis -vis this event system. So every time you activate the program, it fills the, comp the, the uh, monitor with a screen full of precise predictions about, the, about known historical phenomena. So it seems to me uh, if there were a body of uh, informed give and take on the matter, we could quickly settle whether it's just, you know, that I smoked too many little brown cigarettes or that this kind of thinking is in fact going to underlie and restructure science. It's all right. I mean, why should we assume that the basic uh, qualities of the universe have been defined as of 1965 by modern physics? After all, modern physics doesn't explain uh, uh, the unicorn or the flower. So there must be more at work in the universal mix than we have perceived. Well, I think I'll do one more question. Robert. Am I hearing this right? Is this like a historical time graph of human events? Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's a, a way of looking at the life of an individual or a society and asking the question, see, the way I think it, it, this will be, this is good because this it, the spirit to Eastern philosophy is the Tao, and the Tao is the howness of the way things happen. Well, we are so accustomed to allowing these Eastern forms of thought to remain largely formally undefined that we never ask obvious questions about the Tao for existence. For example, uh, in, the, in the Tao Te Ching, uh, the opening words in the Whaley translation are, the way that can be told of is not an unvarying way. Okay, it's a double negative. It's not an unvarying way. It means it's a varying way. Well, anything which varies it is modulated. That's a mathematical term that, we, that has precise meaning. So if the way that can be told of is not an unvarying way, then it can be mathematically described as a set of integers in flux. The, 
problem then becomes what integers? Well, that's a long story, but uh, it's all in here. <laughs> it's uh, and and I'm I'm you know not mad enough to claim that this particular take this particular set of integers is correct, I'm very impressed by its uh, successes. But I am convinced that a theory of this class will eventually explicate uh, time. Time is the spirit. Not the time of flat duration in the Newtonian universe or the very slightly curved time of Einstein's universe but time as lived from moment to moment. It flows like a river. It runs here quickly, there slow and deep. Here there are cataracts. Here there are vast lakes form and all sense of direction is momentarily lost. Time is uh, the continuum upon which our entire experience of being is deployed and yet, up until very recently, the only model we've had of it was this flat or slightly curved surface. That didn't explain the vicissitudes and the synchronicities and the mysteries of our own lives. Now, if we take a fractal model of time, the kind of fractals that we see in the psychedelic experience and the kinds of fractals that we see when we unleash computers in the realm of pure mathematics, then we begin to see the time of pure experience, the time that we recognize where every day is like every other, but different. Every year is like every other, but different. We grow, but we, cha but we stay the same. We move forward at the same time that we move backwards. All of these kinds of feeling-toned complexes about movement in time are handled very well in the fractal. So the Tao, the, what the psychedelic experience has done for me, above and beyond the heart opening and the, what it's done for me as a person, what it's done for me uh, as, a, as a, a seeker after truth, has uh, given me you know, this total description of reality. And I think our senses and our minds and our hearts are always trying to give us a total map, a total mandala is always trying to emerge out of the chaos of, uh, of perception. But it appears to me that it can happen to any depth and that if you still your mind with psychedelics and with discipline and you look into the black rivers that flow through our hearts and our minds, eventually you see not only the truth of yourself, not only the truth of ourselves, but formal truth, the truth of mathematics. And then you have sort of made a kind of closure. And so this is what, this was my personal meditation in Time Wave Zero. I urge you to take a look at it because uh, uh, it's the most original thing that I have done. The rest is the descriptive diaries of an explorer, well uh, footnoted, which I share with you gladly. But this other thing was actually, you know, the logos from on high. That was what my particular relationship to the spirit was based around uh, the revelation of this particular idea, because I had no interest in the I Ching, still less in mathematics and all of the disciplines that impinged on this notion. But somehow, you know, I was chosen virtually because I was standing around when the decision was made. I mean, I really believe that. And, uh, and these things only mean something as they are communicated. But you see, we have great anxiety about the past, about the future. And if there were in fact fractal maps of the future, then that anxiety would, lead, uh, would leave us and would leave us uh, free 
And in one sense, I think that's the transcendental object. It's the manifestation of the spirit. The spirit is with us throughout historical time and space, but it is uh, concretized at, uh, at history's end. Well, that's all I have to say. We're five minutes over. I appreciate your being here very, very much. Thank you.